Okay, great. Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to our uh, symposium series uh, brought to you by the RVA and um, in partnership with the RVA studio where our some of our most fantastic uh, tutors have uh, agreed to talk on some things that are, they feel very passionate about, about their teaching methods and some of their experiences within pedagogy and their research. So I just want to say a really big thank you to Jane and Steve for all you've contributed so far and, uh, and as well for today. Uh, long-standing contributions as tutors and also um, feedback on the program has been really, really helpful. Thank you to the RBA for putting on this talk and for your ongoing partnership. We're really pleased, Oxford Brooks as an institution, to be involved in this way, in this very unique way with the RBA. Okay. Thank you. And, and, uh... Great. Oh, th thank you very much, Maria, and a, a warm welcome to everybody on behalf of the RBA education team as well. Um, so I just want to introduce our, our speakers for today. So we, as, as Maria said, we're really pleased that Steve Boquette and Jane Tankard, who are both uh, Reba Studio tutors, are going to be speaking and um, um, presenting today. Uh, so Steve is a senior lecturer at London South Bank University, um, author of Archidoodle and Archidoodle City, um, and a partner at Tankard Boquette. Uh, Jane is also a senior lecturer uh, and a partner at Tankar Boquette um, and is currently researching the relationship between studio pedagogy and political and social contexts. Um, so what we're going to do today is um, Steve has actually prepared um, a film of his presentation, so I'm going to, to run that shortly. Uh, that's about half an hour or so. Uh, and then uh, Jane's going to deliver her presentation and then there should be some time at the end for uh, Q&A. Hello everyone, my name is Steve Boquette and today's presentation is entitled The Beautiful Accident, Cybernetics, Synetics and Serendipity, Defining Creative Design Pedagogies Through Oblique Strategies. My interest in the field of cybernetics started with the music and the ideas of the cultural polymath Brian Eno in the early 1970s. Eno initially came to prominence as a glam rock star with the band Roxy Music, from which he then went on to create his own music, leading to the invention of a new genre of recording, which he entitled ambient music. His writings on this new form revealed processes which tapped into notions of evolutionary principles, chaos theory, cybernetics and chance, as a generator for creative thinking. His collaborators with others, David Bowie, Talking Heads, U2, James, Coldplay, but to name a few, also revealed how this creativity could be applied to music outside his own operational field. The allure of these ideas stayed with me all the way through my university education and the influence of my design tutors such as David Green of Archigram fame reaffirmed an interest in the work of systems artists who were prominent in the early 1970s. In my master's degree at the Royal College of Art in the 1980s, I experimented with ideas for an evolutionary communication bridge over the River Thames. This was a project based upon Eno's diagrams which are illustrated on the sleeve of Music for Airports. Then later on, when I started teaching architecture, <clears throat> I introduced design projects such as the Pavilion of Serendipity, which is a kind of twist on the Serpentine Pavilion, and another project called Cybernetic Street, which was an exotic street and marketplace of evolutionary change. In 2003, I was invited to contribute to Tom Porter's book, Archispeak, a lexicon of architectural terms and phrases used by architects and academics. Unsurprisingly, the words that I chose to describe were cybernetics, serendipity and mapping. As many students who I've taught over the years would confirm, I've continued with this approach often using my own version of Eno's oblique strategy cards as a device to promote innovative thinking. In this short presentation, I will be introducing you to the concepts central to cybernetics, 
cinetics and serendipity, with a particular emphasis on how these ideas may be applied to creative teaching and learning with the aim of sidestepping more conventional practices and methodologies. So the great Louis Pasteur once said, chance favours the prepared mind. So the issue is that this paper will begin the process of reclaiming a number of diverse and often unconventional teaching methods that evolved from post-war scientific and academic debates leading to the innovative practices of a number of art and architectural schools in the 1960s. These radical pedagogies in education at the time were born out of a culture that examined and challenged conventional thinking and were given license to question the very structure of how we understand the creative process. The theory and practice of cybernetics and its offshoots, synetics and serendipity, have been defined and described through avant-garde experimentation by key creative artists working across disciplines since 1945. The diagram on the screen at the moment shows the difference between what one might term as artificial intelligence and also uh, contrasted against cybernetic thinking. So their explorations will form the focus of this investigation into how, we, how these theoretical concepts can be utilised during the early stages of creative design to help liberate and cultivate new and sometimes polemical positions. This study will begin to decipher and describe what is often seen as an irrational process, a notion of what artist composer Brian Eno has defined as oblique strategies, an oracle for sidestepping conventional thinking. Now, my feeling is that design education should, as this paper suggests, encourage students to practice acts of creative disorientation so they, that they are pre prepared to exploit the virtues of a serendipitous world. Cybernetics started in the mid 1940s from 1946 to 1953 as an outcome of the multidisciplinary Macy conferences, the American mathematician Norbert Weiner published a paper entitled Cybernetics or Control and Communication in the Animal and the Machine that was done that was published in 1948. Weiner noted that as there was no existing word for this complex of ideas I felt constrained to invent one hence cybernetics which I derived from the Greek word Kubernetes or steersman, the same Greek word which we uh, we derive the word governor from. Viner, Viner's publication in parallel with other noted works on cognition in animals and computing developed into a new way of looking at a unified theory of systems. So here's a diagram showing how the, the very forces that people like Viner were looking at, everything from evolutionary biology through to complex adaptive systems, and then through to what he called emergency and self-organizing systems. So as Dubele and Pangero state in how cybernetics connects computing counterculture and design, written in 2015, not just mechanical and electrical systems, but also biological and social systems. In other words, a unifying theory of systems and their relation to their environment. The theory that underscores the principles of cybernetics is relatively simple. The process of information feedback for correcting the future behavior of what one might call a system. Within conventional reasoning, 
the onus tends to be towards error correction. But an important distinction of the cybernetic model is that it can embrace chance encounter and error as part of its system, using this feedback information as a source for generating an evolved position. A feature of an adaptive system is that its variety and total range of outputs determines its potential for survival and its future identity, identity amongst its deri derivatives. This method of self-education by a form of trial and error is known in an organic structure as heuristic. Within the activity of designing, the heuristic instruction incorporates the unexpected and the unfamiliar as an opportunity for expression. Chance encounters are viewed as potentials for use and the adaptation of their original direction of an idea manipulated to suit these new ingredients. As Brian Eno stated himself in 1976, this type of structure wasn't merely of interest to experimental musicians. It came from a wider set of ideas about social organization, ideas which were part of a new paradigm in which hierarchical structures would give way to heuristic processes. These concepts will base themselves on the assumption of change rather than stasis, on the assumption of probability rather than certainty. It's important to note that the development of the theory of cybernetics is and was not a fixed entity and the leading figures such as Heinz von Foster, Gordon Pask, Margaret Mead, Stafford Beer, and the author of the Whole Earth Catalogue, Stuart Brand, to name a few, began to expand the scope of cybernetics to embrace both scientific and artistic disciplines, making it universal in its application. Furthermore, the development of what has been called second order cybernetics identified that the observer of a system was in fact part of that system, its constructor, and that the language used in the process of communicating this information was one of the fundamental attributes in the creation of what we call society. This shift in the mainstream in mainstream scientific analysis from what one might call objective to the so-called and so-called rational thought to one which is subjective suggested a move towards a kind of interdisciplinarian and towards counterculture. Andrew Pickering stated, I've always thought of design along the lines of rational planning the formation of a goal and then some sort of intellectual calculation of how to achieve it. Cybernetics, in contrast, points us to a notion of design in the thick of things, plunged into a lively world that we cannot control and that will always surprise us. So this next slide shows a poster which was uh, in 1968, the first international exhibition in the UK devoted to the relationship between the arts and new technology. It was called Cybernetic Serendipity, the Computer and Arts, and was displayed at the ICA in London. And this is a slide of that exhibition. It was a groundbreaking exhibition designed by Francesca Thermerson, presented the work of over 130 partic participants, including composers, engineers, artists, mathematicians and poets. Um, after a few months later, the machine is seen at the end of the mechanical age was another exhibition at MoMA in New York and featured the work of experiments in art and technology, EAT, 
And it is by no coincidence that Peter Schmidt, co-author with Brian Eno of the Oblique Strategy Cards, was part of the team involved in the ICA event. So moving on now, I, that, that kind of briefly covers some ideas about um, cybernetics. I'd like to move on now to talk a little bit about the word serendipity. In his 2007 book, The Black Swan, The Impact of the Highly Improbable, Talab sets out the theory of how the world has been shaped by unpredictable and random events, that black swans are unanticipated events that have a large scale effect. So the black swan is a rare bird in the lands and very much like a black swan. When the phrase was coined, the black swan was presumed not to exist. However, in 1697, Dutch explorers became the first Europeans to see black swans in Western Australia. The term sub subsequently metamorphosed to connote the idea that a Im perceived impossibility might later be disproved. Taleb named this strategy for maximizing serendipity after Apelles the painter, a Greek who tried as he may, could not predict, sorry, could not depict the foam from a horse's mouth, in irritation gave up and threw a sponge that he was using to clean his brush at the picture. And where the sponge hit, it left a beautiful, beautiful representation of what he had been trying to create, the foam. In other words, the foam on the horse's mouth. So moving on. Um, James Lawley and Penny Tompkins in their paper Maxi Maximizing Serendipity, the art of recognizing and fostering unexpected potential, a systematic approach to change expanded upon and arranged Taleb's ideas into what they described as a perceptual model of serendipity. The slide is up here. So first of all, we start off on the left hand side with what we described before as the prepared mind. In other words, one is open to any kind of thing that that might impact upon it. And then along comes an unexpected event. The prepared mind recognizes a certain kind of potential. One then seizes the moment. This is what might be called iterative circularity. You amplify the effects of that moment and then you evaluate those effects. In other words, the value of the original event and the subsequent effects become apparent, at which time serendipity can, can be said to have taken place. So this is in effect trying to show the system of how one might embrace chance and one might embrace uh, an unexpected event. Uh, this happens all of the time, I would suggest, when um, one is developing ideas for architectural projects, for instance. Even the kind of slip of a pencil might imply a different direction to somebody's scheme. Certainly the act of having tutorials, for instance, often throw in unexpected pieces of information, which then become embraced by by the student or by the architect in the development of their idea. So the next and final word that I wanted to look at was this word called synetics. And the name synetics again derives from the Greek, the joining together of different and apparently irrelevant elements. Initially developed by George M. Prince, and William J.J. Gordon 
in the 1950s as a methodology for problem solving within group meetings, it was expanded upon to become a tool for cultivating creativity. Traditionally, the creative process has been considered after the fact. The Synetic study has attempted to research creative processes in vivo whilst it is going on. The principal aim of the Synetic process is to produce imagine, imaginative positions by sidestepping rationality and conventional approaches in favour of making an intuitive approach. <clears throat> Gordon gives great credence to the met metaphorological process to make the familiar strange or mysterious and the strange familiar or knowable. This is encourages, on the one hand, fundamental problem analysis, and on the other, the alienation of the original problem through cre cr the creation of analogies. It is thus possible for new and surprising solutions to emerge. The key drivers in this working method is what might be called a relaxed use of four kinds of metaphor and analogy. That is personal metaphor, direct metaphor, symbolic metaphor, and fantasy metaphor. Uh, and on the screen now, what I've shown is some synetic exercises, how one might look and embrace the opposite as part of your study. I first became aware of synetics in the 1980s through the work of the illustrator and artist Russell Mills in an exhibition entitled Fine Lines at the Thumb Gallery in London. As with Mills, I'd always been captivated by the work of artists such as Kurt Schwitters and the artist Marcel Duchamp. And of course, as I've been speaking about earlier, Brian Eno. Mills adapted Eno's song lyrics as a starting point for 65 painterly constructions that form the exhibition. Given the wide, um, the wide and diverse range of subjects, such as spontaneous human combustion, military strategies, random associations contained with the lyrics, contained within the lyrics, Mills had selected the perfect platform for the working process of what he called intuitive orienteering. This is the, the notion of setting off into an alien territory aided only by in, my intellect and intuition to tackle the terrain. In the book, More Dark Than Shark, um, which was published um, six years after the fine line exhibition. Cultural commentator and writer Rick Poignier revealed how Eno's use of cybernetics and Mills's approach to synetics both showed remarkable similarity in their attitude to the creative output. Poignier also explained that Mills was an active user of Brian Eno and Peter Schmidt's oblique strategy cards. So here's some slide images of uh, the book. Uh, here's some of uh, Russell Mills's collages that were generated from these, um, some of the random words within Brian Eno's music. <clears throat> and what you can see is quite a strange uh, mixture of both the figurative and ash, uh, abstract as well as um, some allusion that are given over to bits of hidden text. So these diagrams here are the ones that I was talking about that are on the album cover, Music for Airports. Eno was developing systems here 
that were evolutionary patterns. And what you can see here is that these are a series of slip systems which uh, are overlaid on top of each other, which forms a kind of musical notation which evolves over time. So finally, on to um, the oblique strategies, um, which uh, these are an example of. So even before the early years of Roxy Music, Eno had developed exercises and systems to be able to challenge conventional ways of producing work. Possibly the best known techniques that he used to prompt his intuition became known as oblique strategy cards. Originally created to overcome the potential of overlooking interesting ideas or sounds that occurred by chance as part of the recording process, Eno began to comply lists of written reminders to unlock potential new avenues of thought for use within the recording studio. These messages consisted of a range of approaches from the technical to the conceptual, the cryptic to the prescriptive. <clears throat> His original 64 cards contain messages such as discover the recipes you are using and abandon them. Repetition is a form of change. Make a sudden, destructive, unpredictable action and emphasize the flaws. Contrast these with the more mysterious messages such as organic machinery, ghost echoes, and we have something approaching the cybernetic evolutionary feedback and synetic polemical models. Eno discovered that he was not the only person using this form of creative oracle within, excuse me, within his work. His close friend, the artist Peter Schmidt, devising a similar set of instructions and observations to aid his own work. This inevitably led to their collaboration and the combining of both sets of strategies with the addition of some new material to form a set of 100 cards published as a box set in 1975. These cards evolved from separate observations of the principles underlining what we were doing. Sometimes they were recognized in retrospect. In other words, intellect catching up, catching up with intuition. Sometimes they were identified as they were happening, sort of in the middle of the process. They can be used as a pack or they can be drawn or or be drawn a single card from a shuffle pack when a dilemma occurs in a working situation. In this case, the card is trusted, even if its appropriateness is not, is, is, is unclear. Eno expanded on the value of these methodologies by stating, the reason we invent procedures that expose us to the error and disorientation arising from un unpredictability is because we need to be well rehearsed and enduring this, in, this disorientation. It is vital to our survival. To innovate successfully, we must be able to avoid panicking in situations where we are not in full control. Art and creative design offers us a rehearsal space for, the, for this very process. The essential importance of each of the fields of operation outlined earlier, cybernetics, serendipity and synetics, are that they allow us the opportunity to engage <clears throat> in acts of risk taking, but within a partially structured framework. This form of game playing allows us creativity with impunity, 
affording us a space to explore new ways of thinking without the strictures of convention. When Eno speaks about the role of art as being an act of surrender, he alludes to the same notion that art is a place where one can suggest the irrational and the dangerous and the beautiful and the ridiculous as a means of practicing possible future scenarios within the confines of a free and safe environment. And to quote Brian Eno to finish off here, honor thy error as hidden intention. So um, just to finish off with, I put this uh, just posted. This was one project that was done by uh, an Oxford Brooks students many years ago. It got shortlisted for the President's Medals. Uh, you can check it out. It's still there online. Um, and it used um, cybernetics and serendipity as a structure in which to design the whole of their project. And that's all. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, great. Uh, thanks very much, Steve. Uh, and now I think um, we'll move over to Jane and she's going to share her screen and deliver her presentation. Hello, my name's Jane Tankard and my paper today is titled A Few People, A Brief Moment in Time, A Search for a Feminist Pedagogy in Architectural Education. This paper, like the majority of my practice of my third year undergraduate studio at the University of Westminster, which I teach with Tom Grove, attempts to analyse and under understand the hegemonic nature of the profession, the role of the architect as colonised servant and colonising autocrat, and the need to enable students to develop an architectural language informed by subjective and objective post-structuralist investigations. And this is a quote from Kevin Rowbottom in his book, Form to Program. The accept accepted assumption that persists today that an experienced or celebrated architect is equipped to teach derives from the assumption that the school is fundamentally a site of skill acquisition and apprenticeship. The necessary separation between practice and education was almost totally ignored during my undergraduate education. Theory being an academic speculation that was useful as a means of testing and then rejecting political resistance rather than an opportunity to develop a process of thinking, an articulacy of speculation and reflection. This year the University of Sheffield's journal Field published a film made by Studio Juggernaut, a research group which I lead along with a number of my ex-students in response to the Black Lives Matter movement. This film is a collection of testimonies from students of their experiences and silencing within architectural education. Part of my continuing quest to define a pedagogy that liberates, enables and gives a voice to the other, this work attempts to challenge how we as architectural educators colonise educational spaces and the profession beyond. The privatisation and corporatization of education and the subsequent erosion of academic autonomy where practice gains ground in determining what and how we teach means that any challenge to the status quo is assimilated through the apparently depoliticised forum of the profession. We are designing the cities, towns and landscapes of our very small and fragile planet. How these opportunities for social and creative transformation manifest and the impact we have on every global citizen, as well as the earth itself, has a huge amount to do with how we dream and explore while students. We must be free to interrogate the profession, particularly whilst outside of it. The university is a key site for reproducing the knowledge, culture and power in our society. But universities are complex places, not just reproducing, but also contesting and creating knowledges, culture and power. They are a priority for feminist work for several reasons. First, because their status and history are being used to authorise and reproduce patriarchal, corporate and state power. 
Second, because universities are being dismantled as sites for accessible education, critical thought and political challenge. Third, because universities hold a responsibility to all the people of our society and world for whom they act as a repository of knowledge and a source of education. And fourth, because we need them. They can keep alive our hope and become our meeting place for a collective practice. And that's um, from Strategie Feminist 1999 uh, from, by Keith Louise Fulton. In order to explore a radical dialogue in architectural education, it might be necessary to consider the political constructs that determine the institution as a site of power, the use of language to embed hegemonic frameworks throughout society, and the historical persistence in our profession in the notion that the education of the architect is one of deconstruction and reconstruction from tabula rasa to practitioner, embedding and maintaining the dominant professional and societal values of capital. In 1988, three years after his wife's unexplained and untimely death, the celebrated artist Carl Andre was acquitted of Anna Mendieta's murder due to a lack of evidence. The story, which has intrigued and infiltrated architectural discourse, for example, through this uh, source unknown, I'm, I'm sorry to say, representation of the threshold between the domestic interior of an apartment where an argument has taken place and the ghostly print imprint of what could be Anna's body on a street in New York is a useful reminder of the dichotomy between academia and practice, of how we can, through a deliberate construction of Katerina Ruedi's notion of an ar architecture against the grain, carve spaces of liberation and creativity. Four years after Andre's acquittal in 1992, the Guggenheim Museum in New York opened its new gallery in Soho and one of the artists exhibiting there was Andre. At the opening and during the subsequent days of the exhibition, over 500 protesters picketed, holding banners that read, Where is Anna Mendieta? and Carl Andre murdered Anna Mendieta. In response, Philip Verne, the director of Mocker New York, responded with the statement, Carl broke something and he was ostracised and it's part of the story. But the work is there. We are a museum, not a court of law, and he is one of the most important artists of our time. This notion of the individualist artist as having godlike cultural value beyond their responsibilities as a privileged member of communalised society, to some extent continues to permeate architecture and its production from the competitive, individualised nature of contemporary architectural education the cult of the signature architect and the disparity between what we believe and value as a profession and what we actually do. Andre, probably best known in the UK for his work Equivalent 8, 1966, and a range of mint of bricks exhibited at Tate Britain in 1972, is known primarily for his role as a key member of the US 20th century postmodern minimalist art movement, predominantly populated by white middle-class men. Mendieta, on the other hand, a Cuban exile with a traumatic and disturbing life experience, was a radical feminist artist whose work was unsettling, provocative, political and difficult to value as a commodity, the majority of her work being ephemeral, transitory and constructed in landscapes and spaces without audience. If André's work is the definition of modernist principles, rational, reductivist, objective, minimalist, commodified, Mendieta's work is the opposite, complex, subjective, ephemeral and intangible. Rejecting the reductivist ideas inherent in her husband and his fellow artist's work, she made art with her body, often physically placing herself within nature, and then recording it using film or photography. She also reconstructed acts of violence by men towards women, using her own body to narrate visually the actions of the perpetrator and the language of the law. 
Her work through its subject, needs of production and subsequent representation outside of the art gallery politicises the female body in terms of identity and cultural context and challenges the notion of the work of art as commodified object. Characterised from the point of view of the subject and subjective thinking, Mendieta's work is performative, site-specific, personal, post-minimalist. She followed the objective to eliminate the object, to subvert the artist's authority and to involve the viewer more actively. Rather than arrange objects, Mendieta connects herself to and inhabits the world in which she lives. Her work follows a more phenomenological ideology which examines and interrogates the self. Identity, something fragile, uncertain and polymorphic to Mendieta, is central to her practice. In Can the Subaltern Speak, a pivotal piece of writing by Gayatri Spivak, exploring the colonising and disempowerment of the other through the use of hegemonic language, Spivak discusses a conversation between Michel Foucault and Gilles Deleuze, two theoreticians whose work permeates Western architectural educational discourse and much contemporary studio practice. The participants in this conversation emphasise the most important contributions of French post-structuralist theory. First, that the networks of power, desire and interest are so heterogeneous that their reduction to a coherent narrative is counterproductive and therefore a persistent critique is needed. And second, that intellectuals must attempt to disclose and know the discourse of society's other. Spivak goes on to discuss this notion of sovereign subject and how the persistence of those power structures that are informed by the means of production in all forms creates an other for whom the language of hegemony is neither relevant or accessible. In particular, she identifies the notion of the subaltern, for whom the language of the coloniser or oppressor is neither, neither available, relevant, of value, or even navigable. Mendieta's work seems to position itself within Spivak's space of gendered silencing, but has defined and con constructed, through polemical art, a different language. These notions are central to my practice as an architectural educator. The premise that the student must be deconstructed and reconstructed was a disturbing process that in the 80s and 90s was completely overt and is thankfully being addressed and actioned in collaboration with contemporary and alumnus students throughout UK architecture schools. In the call to action that I described earlier from the University of Sheffield, um, the film that we made uh, explores the experience of a diverse group of students identifying mechanisms for reciprocity and the disrupt deconstruction sorry, of systems in architectural education and practice that exclude and obfuscate those who are and represent societal and individual other. And they made a collective statement, which I'm now going to read out. To testify is to articulate the hegemonic silences that we experience but do not speak. To listen is to bear witness to these political narratives, a necessary ethical responsibility that enable, enables us to create a space of agency and transformation. The modernist construct of educational space and the architecture profession's embedded corporeal sense of the student as tabula rasa obfuscates and denies not only our identity, cultural values and meaning, but also the realities of daily life for students when outside of the university studio space. The film attempts to expose a fundamental problem that students from ethnic, working class and deprived backgrounds consistently face. They feel they must eradicate their identity, cultural knowledge and experience in order to become a version of the professional who operates within acceptable margins of means of production, knowledge accretion and resistance. For architecture and architectural education is intrinsically embedded in the constructs that assume 
that the other, the one who does not speak the language of power, is dangerous and destabilising. As Antonio Gramsci posits, patriarchy and hegemony are founded on the need to quieten, disarm or make weak the antagonistic group or other in order to disenfranchise rebellion, to retain power and lead the mass. In her book, Privacy and Publicity, Beatrice Colomina describes Le Corbusier's mural graffite à Cap Martin, painted in the interior of Eileen Gray's house, E1027, and very much against her wishes, as a defacement of Gray's architecture, and perhaps even an effacement of her sexuality. It seems that Le Corbusier is behaving in a manner true to Gramsci's premise, threatened and in competition with Gray, his mural and apparent obsession with the need to attack, mark, penetrate and control her house are a manifestation of his need to render her powerless. Like Gray, Mendieta's work also falls into Gramsci's space, unknown until her death, difficult to commodify and dealing unflinchingly with issues rejected and ignored by the institution. Her work is defined by unearthing and defining the notion of other rejected by institutional conformism. When, after her death, her art was exposed and claimed by women globally, the media and art world closed ranks, belittling and undermining her personally as well as her art. So the next part of this uh, paper is called Studio Practice. Take off your shoes and walk along the beach through the ocean's last thin sheet of water. Gliding landwards and seawards, you feel reconciled in a way you would not feel if there were a forced dialogue between you and either one or other of these great phenomena. For here, in between land and ocean, in this in-between realm, something happens to you that is quite different from the seaman's alternating nostalgia. No landward yearning from the sea, no seaward yearning from the land, no yearning for the alternative, no escape from one into the other. So using Van Eyck's assertion that the space between the threshold or intersection is a site of creativity and opportunity, our studio practice is formulated around the notion of a constructed theoretical hybrid space between the Congress International de Architecture Moderne's modernist principles and the anti-modernism of the Situationist Internationale. Embedded in this context is a forensic interrogation of the notion form follows function as a cipher which must be fully understood as a reductivist concept that embeds social structures, that reinforces patriarchal systems and conversely has the potential when, when reconstructed through a process of Situationist detournement for exciting programmatic opportunity. The latter evolves from the question as to whether the notion is a statement of what exists or a manifesto for what might be and then how it might be applied creatively to design methodologies. Using the notion of hybridising Siam and the SI, which comes directly from the idea that there is a space between André and Mendieta, we create choreographic drawings that integrate the scientific, the rational, the measurable, with notions of cosmic reality, of phenomenology and poetic experience. The drawing, which is understood as a composite representation, which may exist beyond the boundaries of the sheet of paper, analyzes a moment of protest, social significance and ephemerality using architectural orthographic drawing techniques, for example, traditional forms of representation to explore the possibility of the other in architecture through some kind of transformation of their coding. As such, the process attempts to facilitate a number of strategic and represented forms of understanding which are underpinned by the need to develop radical new architectural typologies using language and systems that integrate the technological, social and economic needs of the 21st century. 
These mechanisms include the principle that the programs and typologies that we design for are reflexive constructs that exist between the structures of power and the manifestation of commodity, challenging the notion of a reductivist understanding of the everyday as being something that is acceptable and aspirational in terms of the architectural brief. So we're looking at these spaces between uh, academia and practice and uh, one of those spaces is the binary notion in extremists of the apprentice versus the post-structuralist creative and the need for institutions to continue to enable to help and support the other as a creative and positive force. In order to develop this position we explore the threads that divine, define the process of creative production and action. Context, identity and representation often formed of fragments, ideas and moments. These threads are, in a sense, apolitical acts. They are narratives that weave their way through our histories and storytelling, enabling us to view the political, social and cultural spaces, both literal and metaphorical in which we work and learn as a palimpsest of cultural perspective and identity. So how do we begin establishing what these threads are? In the studio we start with a fragment, something buried, unknown, seemingly unimportant or, for example in the case of Anna Mendieta, unresolved, but always a moment which is provocative in terms of its reproduction and creative in terms of its opportunities and possibilities for thinking about typology. Tracing a line between what is and is central to academic research and architectural education, we value anecdotal writing, memory, emotional response, as well as oral and other historical analysis. The studio is structured through non-linear multiple anecdote as a form of hierarchic inversion, a feminist construction as backed in dialogic encounter and imagining. It rejects the notion that we should test architecture within the school through the values of the profession, particularly if those values are based on altruistic, paternalistic views bound by educational criteria and a specific notion of what is complete. In my essay, A Few People, A Brief Moment in Time, Architectural Experiments 1987 to 1991. I discussed the relationship between the political context to the late 20th century demise of the art school and a postgraduate education in architecture at South Bank Polytechnic during the late 80s. In it, I explore how, through a transformative and extraordinarily radical educational context that began by my being taught by Kevin Rowbottom, who I quoted at the beginning and then subsequently organising our own education, the student cohort ran our final year ourselves, employing the people we wanted to help us, which included poets, choreographers and structural engineers, as well as artists, although I recall no artists, no architects rather, we were unable to learn, experiment and collaborate with a non-conformist, non-hierarchical, experimental environment a brief moment of truly radical postgraduate architectural education. This unique experience was absolutely central to forming my agency and began my growing critique of architectural education. In the first term of, the fir first of our first master's year, we worked collaboratively building a huge plaster model of Birmingham Spaghetti Junction, which was our site, for an architectural competition. Which can, this model contained casts of fragments of our bodies embedded within it. Photographs had been submitted with drawings to the competition and Tate Britain had agreed to exhibit it in their entrance hall. We left the studios that Friday in great excitement, only to return on the following Monday to find the model had been almost completely destroyed, smashed to pieces by, it turned out, the acting head of department. A moment of extreme reactionary violence in an architectural context that once again illustrates Gramsci's notion. 
The situationist notion of decomposition suggests that we are locked in a state of endless cultural repetition and hegemony in which through endless acts of recuperation all radical ideas are dissolved and rendered powerless, a new future held back by the delay in the revolutionary liquidation of capitalism, a concept our students, regardless of their background, have no problems engaging with. They embrace Mikhail Bakhtin's analysis of Dostoevsky's construct of the notion of carnival space as a creative threshold where normal hierarchies and conventions are either dissolved, reversed or inverted, defining potential sites from which we explore design. And just to say that this work is a piece of work by uh, Simi Alowu, who um, used the process that I just described to um, invert and kind of reconstruct colonial architecture in the southern states of, of the USA. Experimentation into narrative, memory, local histories and knowledge weave together intense periods of research and analysis with action making, post making, reflection, representation, representation, shifts in readings of scale and language and remaking. Using mechanisms including mapping, coding, appropriation, hybridizing and superimposition, students engage in a process of iterative making at scales ranging from 1 to 2,500 to 1 to 1 and back again. The notion that architectural education and production is led by the tutor is discounted in favour of a collaborative exploration where no assumptions can be made about notions of typology, programme or technology. Using collaboration as a prerequisite of our daily activity in the studio, we begin the academic year creating measured drawings that explore the context to specific representations of historic events in painting and filmmaking, creating choreographic drawing as a means of analysing, defining and representing codified space. These representations are drawn and redrawn, examining the detailed architecture, context and bias of the original depiction of the political moment. This work is then superimposed onto the site to enable a political reading of the physical context a reconstruction of the choreography and its history, as uh, described here, informs a physical intervention. The potential for inhabitation rather than program is then explored and defined. This, this work actually is by Ali Montero. It uh, relates to Emily Davison, uh, who died pinning a, um, a rosette onto the king's horse. Um, she was a suffragette. And um, this, yeah, so the process I'm now describing is really um, con relating to her slides. These representations are then used as a kind of dressmaker's pattern through which much of the students' experiences, knowledges and discoveries are woven. And, and this creates a rich methodology from which a new project evolves. The work is grounded in a critical space where students explore histories and ideas that personally resonate with their experiences and worldview, creating a richer, more diverse set of architectural responses and often individual and unvisited architectural form. Each student establishes their own political position and manifesto, site readings and notions of inhabitation or programme. Most projects are polemical, and use the drawing as a means of interrogation rather than representation. We give out one brief at the beginning of the year only, and after that we evolve the project, responding to the students' individual concerns, constantly contextualising the project's cultural position using text, film and writing. We always accept a student's interest and concept, assuming that almost any starting point, if constructed through this detailed analytical process is a potential A-star scheme. We assume the process of searching for a valid or perfect concept is pretty much redundant and a waste of precious time 
because so much of concept comes from the notion of the sketch. So basically what we're doing is just reinforcing something that is you know, normal in architectural uh, uh, schools, which is to really thoroughly research client and, and history and um, notions of programme. We encourage students to align themselves with others and value the opportunity for more than one project to start from a similar position, even an identical premise. We also encourage students, uh, quite controversially, to swap projects or to um, start working together on one project before returning to um, individuals' own projects or swapping models and um, uh, changing them and transforming them with the knowledge that the student has from the other project. As tutors, we spend a great deal of time pushing students to develop their own critical awareness and pro process rather than act as, acting as critics ourselves. And we do everything we can to dismantle the hierarchical relationship between studio and tutor, sorry, between student and tutor, trying wherever possible to democratise decisions within the group and individually and predominantly through the use of precedent and theory. And ultimately, I would say that we both try and teach as we wish we had been taught in undergraduate. And I still try to teach where I can in terms of how I was taught to learn at postgraduate. Thank you. That's amazing. That was amazing. Well, I, I would love to get questions from the audience. I know there's a lot of tutors here. Um, if we get some some thoughts or questions, it was fantastic. And I and I watching it, I, I thought I want to watch this all again. So this is all people. My bleak strategy cards, and then I can just give answers yes. randomly. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fantastic. That's amazing. Um, is anybody courageous enough to ask a question? Amazing, I, yeah. yeah. I will just fill in here for one moment. When I was making my film, um, I did actually screw it up a bit. So I, I edited the wrong bit and I left it in because when I looked at it, when I looked back at it, I thought actually it's better than what I planned to do. So that's also right. part of the process. So yes, exactly. I was embracing, I was embracing serendipity yeah. within, even within the edited film. Yeah. In fact, thought... actually what really happened was I ran out of time. <laughs> I think also the bit that I, I sort of left out there that I didn't really explain that is, that is quite important, I think really, is that that early work, the work that the students do, is superimposed onto the site and is then interrogated within the context of the site and the programme. So um, I think what we're both talking about in a way is the idea that things might be very fluid, you know, that, 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 the, that it's not linear in any way. And, um, and I think also I'm some of my students are in the room and I think they're a bit shocked now because they don't know this bit about swapping their projects. Yeah, I wanted <laughs> to ask about that. But, can, can you say yeah, something about that and why? Why you? Why yeah, that's so, so it doesn't happen formally. We don't do it formally, but but what we what we I suppose what we're doing in a way is is what uh, Steve is talking about with with Eno, and I've just realised this today, is actually it's it's about having. Um, different perspectives on to, like it's much more uh potentially creative i think and valuable to actually um sort of transpose what you've been thinking onto something unexpected or something that you know but is in the periphery of what you're doing and interrogate it and then reconstruct it so i think that does two things one thing is it it, it kind of makes students feel less precious about their work but also it stops that idea of authorship as being i i've always had this kind of thing about um the profession is so team-led 
you know, and I know that some architects like to say, oh, it's my work or whatever, and there are some issues with, with signature architects, but generally speaking, architecture is so team-led, and yet when you're within the, the education system, it's all about this idea of authorship and competitiveness between students. So I think mm. that that's what we're trying to dismantle in a way. We're just talking about the idea that as a cultural output, what we're doing is a sh as a studio. It's not about individuals. I mean, one year when I was doing, we were doing this, we, we, we had a year where the students really embraced the process fully. And we had 17 students and 13 got firsts. And they didn't expect to have that. We didn't expect to have that many first. But I think it was it was there was a sort of liberation in suddenly actually the work even wasn't their own. It became it was somebody else's. They didn't have to worry about it anymore. We told them they'd already got first, you know, and, and all the others actually got really high two one. So it was a really amazing year. But it is dependent on being brave. And I think since post covid, that has been, and during COVID, that's been really difficult. So just, sorry, I'm mm. talking loads again, but I would just say that this process I'm talking about, um, our best year was the year when we had COVID lockdown, um, but subsequently it has been really difficult to reimagine this process because of the struggles that students have had to be even mm. in a studio. Yeah, hi, it's it's Ed. Um, I am here. Sorry. Oh, I'm okay, listening. okay. <laughs> um, really interesting lectures from both of you. Uh, yeah, that that sounds scary about swapping design projects. It's interesting to hear you say that that, that you do that, and I wouldn't. Yeah, I don't know how I would feel if my tutor turned around and was like, "Actually, you know what? We're going to give you somebody else's project for a month." That seems very scary. Yeah, I know. I've got to say that that um, it. I mean, we do discuss it with the students, and and. Although they swap it, it, it still becomes theirs. It's still theirs, really. You know, they just adapt it. I think it's just a way of, I think what Steve was talking about that's so interesting about oblique strategies in a way, and or happy accident is about, I think it's almost like physical about shifting perspective. So I think mm -hmm. the whole Renaissance idea of one perspective is, is problematic in architectural design. So I think what we're really trying to do, I'm just demonstrating that as a mechanism, but it, it is a much more, it's not its not autocratic in the way that it happens. And usually students can already see it. So we, we did a thing where we swapped models and everyone started chopping up other people's models and remaking them. But I think that, that, that when it's in the context of what you're talking about and learning and understanding, it doesn't seem so scary. I think also, um, I mean, one of the things that the oblique strategies came about really as a device for when one gets stuck in the process. You know, you get completely jammed up and you think, oh, I can't do this and I can't do that and I can't. And in fact, what Eno and Schmidt were saying all the way along is that, that it's better to be working and doing something than doing nothing at all. Mm. So the idea of swapping projects immediately gives you that that kind of freedom to be able to contribute to the direction of an idea or the direction of a project because you can become critical of it. Mm. Mm. So, mm. Um, but the the oblique strategy cards were always as a sort of device for unpicking when somebody had a dilemma. It's it's meant to be an idea of sidestepping the kind of stasis or the, the dilemma that one might get in, which can, which is generally probably an intellectual dilemma. Hmm. Um, and so you add in this other ingredient, it's like cooking, you add in a new, a new ingredient and it changes the direction. Hmm. You probably go back, yeah, you probably go back to where you were or you go back to the the spirit of what you were doing. I don't think. Of course that you do. Of course you, you do. It's you not literally. Not literally. No, literally. you don't ever lose the spirit of the way where mm. your work's going, or mm. the direction of mm. your work, or the direction of the, your thinking, or the way you feel about things. It doesn't change any of that. Mm. 
But I think that there's a really big issue in in um, uh, architecture. We can't see either of you on the screen. Oh, we only only see, only the space in between the the space between architects. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. Sorry. There we go. Um, That's better. Yeah. We, can you see us? Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Problem. So basically, um, uh, I do I do think that. Um, Sorry, I've lost my train of thought a minute there, but um, I, I just think that, that, that there is a real uh, issue about authorship in architectural education. And I think that um, I remember a student um, of mine, um, you know, who just got a, a, a not the bronze medal, but a prize, a drawing prize from Reba and this outraged um M art student from the Bartlett said that there were definitely like you know similarities between his drawing and and their drawing plagiarism. you know and they basically said it's plagiarism and I said well of course it is of course it's plagiarism it's all plagiarism we're all borrowing and you know adapting and so on and then I had to go through this ridiculous process of proving that the project, you know, was actually uh, his own authorship. It was a very weird thing. But I thought, well, that's actually something that I think I really want to build on um, is, is the fact that actually we're all taking and stealing and reappropriating and coding and transforming. And as long as you're not actually, you know, handing in someone else's project as your own without their consent and all of that that goes with it, then, you know, I don't know. But so this process is also very much about students understanding how practice really does work. So although it sounded like all very theoretical and everything, every studio day we talk about practice, or I try to, more in the second half of the year. But, you know, we, we, th we really do try and talk about how what we're talking about makes sense when you contextualize it in terms of of the profession i think the challenge here is how do we get students on a uh, reba student reba studio students being able to perhaps if they want to engage in this process and i think that's something that i've, I've been thinking about over the past couple of days when i was kind of writing this it's just actually you know what might what might come to, to to how we might make this kind of come to bear in a way because it, it is really interesting just the other day i my students will smile now i went into the studio and i was in a really bad mood and then i just looked at all the work and it made me even, even more in a bad mood and i told them i was in a really bad work mood and said right that's it we're going to do a workshop you know and this is what we're going to do and we had such a great day and in a way it's a little bit like that i can't imagine you being in a bad mood <laughs> <laughs> but you know i just think how do we how do we bring this possibly i'm not saying we should but i'm just saying this question about how about how we teach uh, uh students who are basically at work all day mm. for most of the time you know um because I, I was just thinking the other day about a conversation i had with with two of our students and um i was saying about you know, uh, they were really saying how difficult it is for them when they are in the office all the time. And the expectation of the office is really nothing to do with design whatsoever and, and, and how difficult it, it is. So it's, it's it, yeah, yeah. Are there any other questions? I would just follow on from that. This is Ed again. I, I agree that it's very difficult from our perspective of to collaborate and you in that student environment in um, actual full university, you get all that feedback and you get all that interaction with other students yeah, on the course, the Reba Studio course. It's quite isolating at some points. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know what the answer is to that, but I, I support the, the thought going into it. Yeah. I did want to ask Steve, um, you were saying about these cards, they seem very interesting, but they're tailored more towards music, is it? Or is it? Oh, no, no, no. <clears throat> I mean, and also just to say that I've written my own version. Mm -hmm. So when I was a when I was a student, I used them. And um, 
I made up my own box set. And those were those were just uh, they were kind of um, yeah, kind of um, random thoughts that I'd had when I was trying to develop my own projects. But they're not because they they um, you know if for instance one of the Eno ones classically says take a long walk and so the interpretation of that is quite simple like just forget about what you're doing get out you know that's quite straightforward um there was another one I, i'll tell you this little story because i think this is a wonderful bit of kind of serendipity so uh, that does re relate to music he wrote on one card tape your mouth which conventionally would have meant record your voice so he was in a in the recording studio with a whole bunch of musicians they were trying to work out some music and everybody was arguing with each other and and it was uh, an album for the musician Robert Wyatt. And Robert Wyatt turned around and said, Brian, why don't we use the oblique strategy cards? Because we're all arguing. And they pulled out this card and it said, tape your mouth. In other words, just shut up. <laughs> and within 20 minutes, they'd all shut up and they progressed the music. So it was like the a different um, etymology of the of what, the meaning was behind the card originally then got transformed into another meaning so it depends on what you bring to the game i mean whatever's written on the card probably actually probably doesn't matter too much i mean mine say things like concentrate on the diagonal you know they they are architectural um but it could it could mean anything really. They're they're fairly random. Some of them are also quotations from artists, and I've just literally taken a quotation from say Paul Clay or somebody like that and, and made a note of that, and that forms part of my box set. I think people Ed, not, I'll challenge I'll challenge you, Ed, if you want to use them in a <laughs> tutorial. Yeah. We can. Yeah, no, that sounds interesting. I was going to ask whether there was an architecture tailored set, because that would be very interesting if you sat there in a practice, you think, what am I supposed to do with this building? Just whip out a car and go, add no, some space here and then. No, yeah. next tutorial, next tutorial, we're going to use it when you get stuck. <laughs> Good. <laughs> OK, I think people naturally. Yes. I think people naturally create um, their own sort of versions of the cards and not even realize it so i i had yeah, i had one i used to make where i used to just um record what i was listening to random conversations on the bus and it used to make the most fantastic poems people thought they were yeah. poems yeah, but yeah, actually it's a bit it was just yeah james, it was really... james was saying to me it's, it's not dissimilar from the william burroughs cut-ups mm. or the david bowie yeah. david bowie made song lyrics out of taking old diaries and cutting them up and then wow like removing and collaging the words from old diaries to make songs so Mo moon age daydream was you know i'm an alligator came out of a, a diary or something that he was writing wow. and then you get this random juxtaposition of things to be able to find a new a new meaning or a new a new place. Russell Mills, when he talks about um, synetics, he talks about, I, to, I, I um, talked about intuitive orienteering. He says it's a bit like kind of climbing a mountain whereby you kind of know the vague destination, which is the top of the mountain, but you don't quite know how you're going to get there. And you negotiate the mountain and all of the details of the mountain as part of a journey. The journey is different every time you do it. Um, you have a vague idea where you're going, but not, I mean, in the mountain analogy, it's the top of the mountain, so that's fairly specific. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, he uses that as a kind of 
uh, an analogy to the process. And on that very inspiring note, I think we're going to <laughs> call now. Thank you so much. Thank you again. And we look forward to seeing lots more come from you directly and from your students. Thank you so much. Cool. Thank, Grant, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to yeah. talk about things. It's really good. It's a pleasure. Thank you for all the hard work. Uh, yeah, just a just a repeat sort of thank you very much from us. Um, yeah, really, really, really appreciate your time and kind of extended time in uh, in uh, discussing your presentations and and contributions um, and and lots of ideas and and food for thought. I think. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> and this is the the capstone to our series. So thank you. Fantastic way to close. Thanks very much. Thanks. It's a pleasure. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.